Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today is part of our Secret Space Program interview series. I have a special episode on the mysteries of the Apollo moon missions with Oxford scholar and Giza Death Star book series author, Dr. Joseph Farrell. Now, we've recently touched on the development of hidden technology by former Nazi rocket scientists Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger. Today, we're going to look at the unusual link to the Apollo moon missions and the mysterious Nazi Bell technology. Here we go. Dr. Joseph Farrell. Apollo Moon Missions and Nazi Bell Mystery. Joseph, it's great to have you back for a deep discussion on the Apollo Moon Missions and the Nazi Bell. Now, before we get started, I wanted to call your attention to an unusual article on the Smithsonian website. Let's take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's the title. Reagan and Gorbachev agree to pause the Cold War in case of an alien invasion. (laughs) And then it says the 40th president of the United States was a big science fiction fan. Unreal. Apparently. Apparently. (laughs) And apparently so is the general secretary of the Soviet Union. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gee. (laughs) Well, I guess when you can't stop info from coming out, you just try to spin it, right? Mm -hmm. So the name of the game is Spin the Narrative. Still, it's surprising to me that it's on the Smithsonian website. I'm not surprised. Okay. Uh, No, I'm not surprised. Um, I think the Smithsonian is probably one of those institutions uh, that has been very heavily infiltrated as part of Operation Mockingbird. Hmm. I I really do. there's, there's all of those stories about the Smithsonian deliberately suppressing certain types of archaeological evidence. Yeah, uh, like giants. Like giants and so on. Yeah. Um, I, you know, those stories are very hard to verify, but there's so many of them. I tend to think that, you know, it's a case of where there's smoke, there's some fire. All right. Um, and I, I fully suspect that part of the black budget is – there in that institution for that purpose. Oh, yeah. And, and others. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you why after off the record. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, but, uh, one final thought on the UFO part. Mm-hmm. Why, in your opinion, do we keep seeing these UFO players show up one way or another, uh, the exotic technology players? around the Kennedy assassination, are they, uh, do they have such a vested interest or is it that they need to use people that have been associated with this type of activity? What is it that even when we have Oswald, there's that NASA part. When we have Bannister, Mm -hmm. there's this UFO Mm -hmm. part. When we have um, the uh, Paines, we have Mm -hmm. the connection to Dornberger and all of that exotic technology. What is Mm -hmm. the connection? Oh, well, and Davis, let's not forget him. Oh, yes, right. Uh, you're going to ask me to step off the end of the twig again, but here's what I think it is. Um, I think when President Kennedy made his announcement that we're going to the moon before the decade's out, this was not a, um, again, it was not a maverick shooting from the hip. This was a deliberately well-considered policy decision And I think it was made in part on the basis of some knowledge of some of that inside exotic technology. And the reason I say that is that if you look at the public explanations of the Apollo missions, the idea of doing all of this merely with chemical rockets is a little fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I've always speculated, and and this began for me when I was a kid, you know, glued to the television set like most of us were when Apollo was taking place. Um, When they televised the liftoffs of the LEM, the Lunar Excursion Module, from the moon, my reaction, my father was sitting behind me on his easy chair, smoking his pipe. I'm laying on the floor and up goes the limb. 
And I kind of frowned and I said, and I turned back and looked at my dad and I said, that's not a rocket. Because a rocket accelerates geometrically per unit of time. Slow start gets faster. But the lamb just goes whoop. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And uh, my thinking then was, well, that had to be some other technology in play if what we're seeing is real. And I still think that. So let's go back to Davis. If we're going to get to the moon, that's you can do that. Getting off of it's the problem. <laughs> yes. Okay, right. Yeah, and for that matter, landing on it <laughs> is the problem is a problem, especially if you're going to try and do it with rockets. <laughs> okay. All right. So to me, there was always an element of hidden technology that had to have been in play to get us on the moon and then get us off. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the problem with the limb is, you know, you're sitting right, literally right on top of the, it's like a cab over, you know, semi truck where you're sitting literally on top of the, on top of the engine. It's going to make a lot of noise, <laughs> okay? Yeah. And you're not, you're not hearing this. And you're not seeing, you know, dust and all of this stuff flying away from underneath the limb. It just, whoop, up it goes. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I'm thinking exotic technology was in play. Now, the question is, where did it come from? <laughs> well, I don't think it was good old American know-how, unfortunately. <laughs> Let's go back to Kurt Davis. Where is he during Apollo? Well, he's the guy that's the flight manager for right. Apollo. What project was Davis connected with in Nazi Germany? Well, yeah, he was connected with von Braun's Peenemünde rocket team, but he was also connected with the Bell Project. Ah. And it was that connection with the Bell Project, incidentally, that caused the U.S. Army to reopen his security case because... In 1942, Davis accused one of his colleagues working for the Allgemeine Elektricitätsgesellschaft, the German General Electric, on some sort of plasma project. We don't know exactly what. Um, my, I suspect the bell. It was Davis denouncing one of his colleagues to the Gestapo that was the cause for reopening this case. Ah. Ah. Wow. <laughs> ah. Now, why do I mention all of that? Why is that so significant? Because who else is working for the Allgemeine Elektricitätsgesellschaft at the same time that Davis is working on advanced plasma research? Why, Dr. Ronald Richter. Where does he end up? In Argentina. Hmm. What's he doing in Argentina? Working on fusion projects. <laughs> For Juan Perón, huh. where's his equipment coming from? The Allgemeine Elektricitätsgesellschaft. So in other words, what I suspect is that, number one, you have these post-war Nazis. They're continuing their research, using various host countries to foot the bill for them. And number two, Davis being there at Cape Canaveral during the Apollo missions in the position that he's in, suggest to me that we made a deal with these Nazis for access to some rudimentary form of that technology and that that technology was in play during the Apollo missions. That's why he's there in that position. What was the quid pro quo? Well, I suspect the quid pro quo was that whatever we found up there, the <coughs> they would have access to. Right. Right. Yeah. This is why there's such a pall of secrecy, even to this day, <clears throat> in my opinion, over the Apollo program. Now, the problem, when you, when you look at all of this, is Werner von Braun. Because Apollo was successful, and then shortly after Apollo 11, all of a sudden, Werner von Braun resigns from NASA and goes to work for Fairchild Industries. Mm -hmm. Why did he resign? You know, he was basically head cheese. Well, he gave an interview for Time magazine. It was one of those little things that Time puts in the block at the bottom of the page. And to me, this to me, this was 
absolutely the most stunning thing. He gave an interview for Time magazine where he said that the neutral point of gravity between the Earth and the moon was approximately 43,500 miles from the surface of the moon. Three weeks later, he's gone from NASA. Oh. What happened was, I think he let slip something, maybe deliberately, who knows. And what he let slip was the fact that if the moon was one-sixth the gravity of the Earth, then the neutral point of gravity between the Earth and the moon would be much closer to the moon's surface than the figure that he released. Uh -huh. So he just told us, hey, <laughs> the moon's a lot heavier <laughs> than you've been told. Wow. And if that's the case, that dinky little rocket on the limb ain't going to get us off the moon. <laughs> Something else is on that thing. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm mentioning all this because you've got a certain community out there, Daniel, the Apollo hoaxers, and, and they point to several difficulties in the standard narrative, one of them being the difficulties that NASA was having experimenting with rocket landers, you know, vertical landing on these on these early versions of the LEM out there in the southwestern desert of the United States, giving them all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you know, this is a problem that we weren't going to solve by 1969. They've even made a whole movie where they go into this. And it's called Operation Avalanche. For all of you Apollo hoaxers out there, go watch that movie. It'll blow your mind. Uh, right. particularly, particularly with what, the, what is dropped in the movie about Operation Northwoods and the Apollo program. But anyway. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a biggie. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell it to you off the air. Okay. But um, if, you're, if you're dealing with people that have access to some of this technology and they've actually been able to make it work, and work in such a way that's not deadly to human beings, then, yeah, would you strike a deal with them to fulfill your Apollo, we're going to get there before the decade is out? Sure you would. Mm -hmm. uh, would you keep it secret? <laughs> you betcha you would. Mm. Uh, and turn over whatever you find up there to the Nazis. Now, I know people, I know people think that all of this Nazi stuff is, is uh, far-fetched, and it sounds like it at first at first hearing, but actually go read my books and you'll find out how detailed this case really is. Mm -hmm. But let's look at Apollo 11 itself. When does it land on the moon? 1969. July 20th, 1969. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. The eagle has landed. All right. My question is, who's eagle? <laughs> <laughs> because... The date that Apollo 11 lands on the moon is the 25th anniversary of the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler ah. in 1944. And that's an incredible eagle that they have. That's a, yeah, that's an yeah. eagle. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're striking secret deals with Nazis for access to secret technology to get us on the moon and, more importantly, off the moon, um, what better way to kind of symbolize this whole triumph, you know, of, of the ideology than to land on an anniversary of a failed coup attempt. You know? Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> it just, you know, on and on this goes. So uh, that is, is, that is a triumph date. That's that that is it. a triumph date. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it's fascinating. Um, there's one last Nazi esque connection we should mention here, which is we did a very, special and i think our biggest episode uh, with you on antarctica yes over the summer and it was very well received and opened up all kinds of questions um but people love that episode and there's good reason i encourage everyone to watch it because it's it's phenomenal and of course uh, you did this book hess and the penguins right after that mm -hmm. and we have another episode with you coming up on that but one of the interesting details about the Kennedy assassination is where it takes place. And in that interview, we came up with, in the Texas School Book Depository, uh, the, the, the depository was owned by D.H. Byrd, uh -huh. who, for the first time it was revealed, was the cousin of Admiral, of Admiral Byrd. Byrd. Uh -huh. Now, since then, even more information's come out. 
<laughs> so let's tie all this together. Turns out the f other first cousin and the brother of Admiral Byrd was Harry Byrd. Harry uh -huh. Byrd, who was a senator from West Virginia. Uh huh. And who was in charge of appropriations for the CIA. Uh huh. And we know that during this period of time from 56 to 60 that they refer to LBJ as Senator NASA because he's the mm -hmm. one marshalling all the programs for NASA through, through the Senate. So, uh, Byrd, Admiral Byrd, as you outlined, actually, uh, not only did he do these incredible expeditions, and we know about the fascinating things that he encountered, but he also according to you, at one point, even went over and gave the Nazis lessons about what to do when they got there. Yes. Yeah, Admiral, Admiral Richard Byrd was, when Hermann Goering uh, decided to, to mount that expedition to Antarctica, uh, and, you know, I get into all the other bizarre connections that that has to Hess and, and all of this stuff, but it was Hermann Goering that was the, the ultimate sponsor of that Nazi expedition. He appointed one of his uh, trusted aides, a fellow by the name of Helmut Voltat, to be the actual guy to set up the expedition, find the crew, recruit the scientists, plan the mission, and so on. Um, Voltat, once, once he got going and, and the expedition was taking shape, they brought over Admiral Byrd, to brief the Germans that were going down there on the conditions that they would encounter and so on and so forth, what to watch for, what not to watch for. So Byrd was connected in a very peculiar way to that Nazi expedition uh, because he had been personally invited to come and, and give a series of talks to the crew. Um, Byrd, of course, ends up as the nominal commander of Operation High Jump down to Antarctica after the war. And in the Hess book, I don't know if we talked about this, but another interesting, weird turn of events, you know, talking about all the dead people on the fringes of JFK, his son, Richard Byrd Jr., had been with his father on that Antarctic expedition. His father wrote that lengthy article in National Geographic after the expedition. Um, his son was invited on an anniversary of the publication of that article to come and give a talk in Washington to the National Geographic Society. His son turned up dead, hmm. malnourished and dehydrated in a Baltimore warehouse. He had completely, they, you know, the family put him on the train and he never makes it to D.C. He ends up in Baltimore where he's found dead. Weeks later, uh, w witnesses saw him in the company of some guy that was never turned, uh, turned up, and the Baltimore police appointed a homicide detective to investigate it. Oh. Yeah. So he never makes it to give his you know, honorarium speech for his father at the National Geographic Society. It looks to me like, yeah, it looks to me like they took him out lest, you know, like Gorbachev, he go off script in the, in the press conference <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. And, and reveal too much. You know? Yes, yes. Um, you know, there's always been speculations about, about Operation High Jump. And to me, uh, it says a lot that not only was Richard Byrd in charge and, and part of the planning of that expedition, but also Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz... <laughs> <laughs> and oh. the then Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal. Ah, oh, yeah. Ah. Uh, wow. <laughs> ding, ding. Talk about yet another UFO connection. <laughs> Absolutely. A close friend of JFK and certainly yep. close to the UFO file as a member of MJ-12. Yep. Now, he's the first yep. uh, Secretary of Defense, he and he gets pushed out a window in a naval hospital in the psychiatric wing where he's recovering from a nervous breakdown. Actually, from Bethesda. Yes, Bethesda, exactly. There's a guy, I wish I could remember the guy's name, Daniel, that's written a book about 
the three strange events at Bethesda, Joseph McCarthy, James Forrestal, and JFK. Yes, right, <laughs> all, right. All, all had their strange encounters at Bethesda yeah, Naval it's, Hospital. It's the, uh, <laughs> it's the kind of vortex for those types it's, of events. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> can you tell us what Bird told the Chilean reporter? The This is interesting because there has been an attempt by some academics out there to try to spin that statement as being mistranslation and so on. What Byrd supposedly said, he had a bunch of press with him, and the uh, newspaper of Santiago de Chile, the El Mercurio, picked up, had a reporter, and ran an article about Byrd's expedition, and in the article it says that Byrd said the United States must prepare to defend itself against enemy fighters that can fly to fly from pole to pole with tremendous speed. Uh, there are some academics out there that are saying, well, that translation is a mistranslation, and all Byrd was really trying to talk about was Soviet Union, you know, no UFOs or any of this stuff. However, the problem is the whole explanation for Operation High Jump was that we were going down there to test our tactics, training, and military equipment in Arctic conditions because the Arctic was going to be a hot zone if war ever broke out with the Soviet bloc. All right. Now, Daniel, I've always had a problem with this explanation because you don't need to outfit the expense of a fleet (laughs) and a battalion of Marines and a bunch of scientists, incidentally, just like the German expedition, to haul all the way halfway around the world to the South Pole if you're concerned about Arctic conditions and training against the Soviet bloc, which would occur at the North Pole. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. um, so we can little, just throw that out, right? Yeah, we can yeah. just throw that academic, you know, well, it's a mistranslation and he wasn't, it was really talking about the Soviet bloc. Well, you know, horse pucky is what I say. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's... He's clearly trying to draw attention to something strange happening in Antarctica. If we wanted to train people and test equipment for crying out loud, we can do that in the Yukon Territory of Canada or up in Alaska. You know, they built a highway for crying out loud (laughs) to supply people up there during World War II. So it's not not a matter that we can't get there from here. We can, you know, and we can, yeah, we can do it a lot less expensively than sending a fleet to to Antarctica. Um, So, yeah, you know, the the whole explanation here doesn't make any sense. Um, Something was going on down there. I think they clearly suspected that the Germans found something that they weren't talking about. Um, And as it turns out, we may have found something down there that we're not talking about either. Right. Uh, So, yeah, the whole bird thing, all these connections with the birds at, at Dallas and everything, uh, there, there was something huge going on, and again, it may be UFO related, it may not be, but it's yet another piece to this Kennedy assassination stuff that is so bizarre. It's there, and the problem is, is again, Kennedy, if he's taking aim at the deep state and some of its precious covert projects, Antarctica would probably be right up there among them. Yeah. So we have yet another motivation, you know, whatever it is that we're keeping secret and quiet down there, uh, Kennedy may have been threatening to some degree. Um, again, you know, that's, that's pure speculation, but by this stage, having written all these books about all these strange topics, nothing would surprise me. (laughs) Well, uh, here's a fact that somebody can connect on their own, keeping all that in mind. There is a mount in Antarctica named for the man who owned the Texas School Book Depository. Oh, my. (laughs) (laughs) That does tell us something. That's that's a little bombshell you just dropped right there. Oh my, yeah, that should tell us something. How about mm-hmm. that? Yeah, it yeah. Well, if that's the case, then there's definitely some sort of Antarctic connection to all of this nonsense that that hasn't come out before. Uh, like I say, nothing surprises me anymore. 
all of these things are so deeply, intricately related. Um, nothing surprises me. Now we've passed the 55th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Mm -hmm. The secrecy around it still very tight. We still have the CIA challenging a sitting president on releasing the secret files on the assassination. Mm -hmm. That kind of secrecy is what we're describing when we're envisioning a deep state control structure mm -hmm. and their control over this exotic technology, which I call the X-Tech uh, based on my X-Steganography research. Mm -hmm. With that power differential still entrenched, we can never really expect these forces to ever give up any of those secrets. No. Um, I quite frankly view the the president's decision to release these documents as a bit of a message. Um, and the reason why is I, I do believe that we are watching some sort of uh, factional warfare in the American deep state, and not just the American. I mean, we're seeing it in, in Germany. We're seeing it in Great Britain. Uh, it, it, we're certainly seeing it in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, we could do a whole show on that. Yeah, we could do a whole show on that one. <laughs> Probably several shows. But, um, yeah, we're certainly watching watching some tug of war happening between different factions, and in in this case, I view I view this document's release as a message because they were pressuring pressuring him heavily not to release them at all. All right. Uh, and when he finally decided to go ahead and do it, I was listening to the radio that day just to kind of see how they were going to play this on almost every talk show, Daniel, that I listened to. Uh, and you could probably name the hosts. You know, they're very popular in this country. All day long, uh, a certain JFK assassination researcher who is a defender of the Warren Report and a skeptic of, you know, the conspiracy theories. It has to be Posner. <laughs> it, it, um, he was he was on virtually every show all day long. Oh, forget it. Saying that, well, the documents aren't going to prove anything. You know, it's going to be a big disappointment to the JFK assassination. You know, the spin was being put out before the documents were even yes. being released, and yes. I thought, ah, well, there must be something juicy in them. Lo <laughs> and behold, it's Adolf Hitler. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, it was it was just astonishing to me to listen to this. So I do think that there was some sort of um, message that he and his faction were sending. And, you know, I've said all along, I said last year during the election, that I think if there's one faction that's part of the deep state behind President Trump, it would be the mafia. Uh -huh. You know, he's a real estate developer, had to deal with them on a daily basis in New York City. He's into casinos. Absolutely. You know, there we go. Um, Have we ever seen that deep state war flaunted so much in public as we see it today? The the interesting thing is it's part of a pattern that you can watch with, with Mr. Trump. You know, you had that strange appearance of the military guard during his inauguration. Yes. Then he doesn't show up in the White House for a couple of weeks while they're renovating it. You know, removing the bugs, in other words. <laughs> uh, and then he takes that trip to the CIA where he gathers everybody together in a big room and says, oh, we're going to build you a whole new room without columns. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, there's been messages flying back and forth here uh, if you're if you're carefully watching. And I think the the JFK documents release was definitely a part of it. Um, well, let's not forget that Trump brought up the JFK assassination when he was running for the Republican nomination against Ted Gee, Cruz. <laughs> yeah, isn't that interesting? And he brought up the 9-11 problem, you know. With and Bush, yes. With Bush. <laughs> leading, you know, he went a little off script there, you know, kind, <laughs> kind of like Gorbachev. And, you know, I, I, to me, that the expression on Jeb Bush's face that night when he dropped that <laughs> in was classic. Wow. I mean, we were watching a man creaming his drawers right there <laughs> on, on public television. It, it was priceless. I wish I had a picture of that. Of that, that election, you know, 9-11, the JFK assassination, these things came up in this election. And, yeah. uh, you know, people can remember Trump for, any, if, for nothing else, but if they just remember that he brought up those issues, 
Uh, it's powerful stuff. And the cruise and, thing was fascinating because cruise dropped out about two days, three days later. It was over. Just like just like Jeb dropped out a couple <laughs> of days later. You know, gee, I wonder why. You know, yeah. um, to me, that whole episode was an indicator that he had something on them. Or they suspected that he had something on them. Didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and out they go. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, you know, whatever's going on in Washington right now, swamp draining, I don't know. It's like uh, swamp A is <laughs> versus swamp B. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating to watch. Um, the, the documents release is, is, I think, a huge thing. Um because he was being pressured not to release these JFK files. And, you know, he went ahead and did it anyway. So. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, Joseph, amazing, incredible stuff. Um, your book, which I think is a phenomenal uh, overview, LBJ and the Conspiracy to Kill Kennedy, a coalescence of interests. Very interesting term there, coalescence. I'm glad you brought that in. Everyone, I think, should read this. But it's in the arc of your books because... There's something about the Kennedy assassination that is right in there with that secret system that you've been following. And it, yeah. it's kind of that pivotal moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's the pivotal moment when they were under threat and, and they they literally had to stage a coup d'etat uh, in order to control the situation. And it's been, it's been basically a constant... Uh, effort ever since then to keep the narrative going regardless of, of the cost. And it's, it's unraveling, you know, faster than, faster than they can patch the holes in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, I think, I think it's really all going to unravel, uh, eventually, uh, we're going to see, we're going to see connections to everything, uh, as a result of it. Nixon himself even hinted at it, you know, during the Watergate era. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to sit back and watch how all of this plays out. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think Trump is the end of it. I think he's the beginning of it. Um, Excellent point. Yes. Yeah, oh, he's wow. the beginning of it. Incredible. JFK to Trump and all the stops in between. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Just think of all those stops for a moment. Watergate, Iran-Contra. BCCI, Savings and Loan Crisis, Ruby Ridge, Waco, Oklahoma City, 9-11. Wow. That's quite an arc. Yeah. And if if that doesn't tell you we live in a banana republic with nukes, I don't know what will. <laughs> wow. Incredible. Joseph, thank you so much. Thanks for having me back on. Now, for our next episode in the Secret Space Program series, we're going to be looking at your work regarding Rudolf Hess and Antarctica. Uh, Dark Journalist subscribers will get that episode in their inbox soon. Make sure you sign up at darkjournalist.com. And the Hess book, I imagine, is still available, uh, Joseph, at Amazon.com? It is at Amazon. And it's part of the big story. (laughs) Yes, there's no question about it. And it's gizadeathstar.com for people catching up. Uh, you're doing regular blogs, and you're also doing your uh, from the Nefarium reports as well on a regular basis. Yeah, and news, news from the Nefarium. It's fascinating stuff if you really want to keep up on everything. Yeah, in my members area, there are a lot of webinars, um, vid chats, and so on. Webinar talks. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's in the. Uh, member subscription area that's not part of the public website. Absolutely. And that's what you want to do is become a member at gizadestar.com because that's when you're going to get the full information. So, yeah. you know, it's <laughs> it's nice you provide so much, you know, that's available for somebody for free. But really, when you get down to it, the real stuff is being a member. And uh, yeah. that's inexpensive and incredible value for, for what you get. Thank you. I um, appreciate it. Yeah. So it's great to see you. And we will talk soon. Okay, go. Let's see what Hess got going up in Antarctica. Oh, yeah. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and we'll see you live next Friday at 8 p.m. with episode 51 of the X series. Remember to sign up at darkjournalist.com to get our newsletter to get all the latest updates. See you soon.